Uh, welcome, you're Peter Li. You're from Humane Society International, the China specialist. Um, I'm gonna start the other way around. I approached you for the for the man who tortures cat, but I'm gonna get to that to the end because first I want to ask you about what the latest situation is with med, wet markets in the wildlife wet markets in China. Everybody has seen the videos of it. Um, people think the COVID-19 came from there. Um, mm -hmm. Are people in China closing those markets? Are they still open? You see different stories on that. Yeah, there is a, a lot of uh, confusion regarding the wet markets in China. Uh, actually, there are two different kinds of wet markets. One is wildlife wet market, which arose in the last 40 years. It's something new, a uh, wet market for wildlife. So that's something new. And there is also a wet market for livestock, uh, like uh, chicken, ducks, rabbits. Uh, you know, people can go there and get, pick the uh, uh, the chicken you want, want wanted to slaughter for you. Uh, so that's the more traditional and more uh, common wet market. Now, when COVID-19 broke out in Wuhan, uh, the Chinese government shut down the Wuhan wildlife, uh, wildlife market on January the 1st, so very quick. And then uh, on January the 23rd, uh, the Chinese government shut down all the wildlife markets or wildlife wet markets across the country. So since January the 23rd until today, the wildlife wet markets are still closed. All of However, them? Or just a, okay. Yes, but, but uh, the, the, sorry, the livestock wet markets have been opened. So that's a uh, you know, place where you can get a chicken, you can get a duck to be slaughtered for food. Uh, that market ha, have been opened. So that two, let me say it again, two wet markets one is for wildlife, one is for livestock. So the livestock one uh, has been uh, reopened because the business is also uh, reopened. Okay, but the, the livestock ones, when you say chickens, are those the images we see of uh, the chickens cramped in um, in small cages? And those are those kind of, okay, so it's... it's yes. If you yes. have to describe the situation for animals in those markets, it's not... Uh, those you know markets are also uh, not uh, you know pleasant to see. A large number of animals like a chicken, ducks, uh, and possibly rabbits. Sometimes the fish, of course, the live fish, and sometimes depending on the place, you can see dogs and the cats uh, in those places uh, in you know cages and mixed together. And uh, the uh, you know environment was uh, typically dirty and smelly. Uh, you know, according to Chinese own laws, uh, this wet market should not have existed. But I want to say this, you know, majority of the people in China do not get, uh, you know, uh, meat from these wet markets. Uh, only the older generation, people older, who used to go to these markets for the daily groceries in the 1970s, 1960s. So they sometimes go back to these markets to get warm meat which is still warm not cold warm meat uh younger generation people like us you know working you know uh you know every day so we just do a grocery shopping once a week we go to the supermarkets okay just like like but but when you say the older generation um because china has so many people there's also yes. a lot of people that are older yes. so, so yes. It's still pretty a lot of people go there uh you know, even older generation people, not most of them would not go to these wet markets to buy a uh, chicken and have it slaughtered. You know, some of the people from this generation, like people over the age of 60, right, they want to buy a uh, freshly slaughtered, uh, you know, chicken, they would go there. But still, majority of the people don't go to this market. There are different markets you can get meat, supermarkets, and also regular uh, you know, retail stores for meat, you can go there, but it's frozen. Uh, it's because, you know, if you go to these wet markets for a uh, freshly, you know, slaughtered chicken, uh, you have to wait, right? And the place is always dirty and smelling. So most of the people don't go there. So okay. if you, in terms of sales, right, you know, only about 5%, no more than 5% of the poultry or chicken sales come from this uh, livestock wet market. Okay. And um, so since they think COVID-19 came from the one from a wildlife stock mar wet market, um, so 
no wildlife. So there's no illegal meat has opened in China. Uh, wildlife consumption and wildlife trade for the exotic food market have been shut down. And we have not seen reports about uh, uh, this markets being open. Uh, but we we have read, you know, some, you know, individual uh, reports on individual, you know, violators, you know, violations, you know, selling. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's, uh, you know, very, very small uh, in, in number. Yes. So generally speaking, yes, that have been shut down. Okay. And do people in China also like, will they open again or also they, do they also get a scare? Like maybe this, this um, virus came from here. So maybe we shouldn't do this anymore. Do they also feel that? Yeah, that's a very good question. You know, uh, we have a great reason to question China, whether this trade ban or consumption ban will stay, uh, will be, or will be lifted. Because in 2003, when SARS broke out, the Chinese government lifted the trade ban you know, barely two months after SARS was over. So that's why we have this legitimate, legitimate concern. If it will continue, it will uh, be lifted this time. Now, in China, I have to correct one misperception. Uh, outside of China, people believe that people in China, you know, love, you know, wild animal meat. That's not the, that's not the true. Yeah. Majority of the people don't eat wild animal meat. Uh, only a small number of people uh, eat it. Now, another important point I want to make is that, uh, um, you know, there is no, no demand for wild animal meats from the people. There is always say, oh, there is a demand in China for the meat. There is no such a demand. The demand has been created by the traders, by the breeders. Okay, but, but then the traders and the breeders, but then people buy them, right? So yes. Yes, you know, they, you know, why they would buy them? You know, I can tell you this way. We conducted a research uh, two weeks ago. We went into 212 Chinese families, Chinese households. We opened the refrigerator. We took a look at what's inside the refrigerator. We didn't find a frozen snake. We didn't find, uh, you know, bamboo rats. We didn't find a deer meat or any of the uh, wildlife or uh, wild animal meat. Now. What is not in the people's DNA table, that's not people's traditional food. Now, why people buy those food? Uh, typically, people don't buy this wild animal meat and cook at home. They eat in the restaurant. There's a special restaurant for this you know, kind of meat. Now, why people would go down to eat this uh, meat? Because the traders have, in the last 40 years, been telling the people, wildlife animal meat is good for your health good for your sex if you have a, if you have a if you have a problem having babies it's good for your fertility it's good for your longevity and for ladies it's good for your skin if you want to be beautiful right so they have been aggressively promoting this you know industry or this you know eating habit uh, to the society but uh, okay this may be a weird question but then are people in it's still like when I say people in China, it's still 1.4 billion, I think. So it's still yes. a, a big group. But are they so gullible then that if like if 40 years ago people started promoting these things, are they so gullible that they think, oh, it's going to be good for my skin? It's going to be good for my health. So I'm going to switch to eating this. Oh, absolutely. But I have to say, uh, even though the industry uh, has been aggressively promoting wildlife eating, wildlife consumption, uh, still, it's a small number of people, you know, do it. But of course, as you said, China has 1.4 billion people, even 0.5% of the population. That's an enormous number of people. Um, so, yeah. yes, I would say uh, the industry has been promoted out of a you know, business interest. The government should have done more to tell the people that this, you know, uh, all, all the, you know, uh, propagandas about the industry, uh, is cannot be substantiated by you know scientific evidence, and of course people uh, have to understand you are wasting your money, right? Yeah, yeah, true. But so you have actually no idea whether the sort of whether the wildlife will will open again. You don't know because two cities have banned it for life, but that's only two cities in Chi in China, the whole you country. Know, of China. Yes, the two cities uh, have a banned wildlife consumption because those two cities are not gen uh, ordinary two cities. Those are two cities which have been designated by the Chinese government as experimentation cities. So in other words, 
any policy to be implemented at the national level would always go to cities like these two cities to experiment, to try it, to see how people re react. Now, yeah. so yeah. far, you know, there has been overwhelming support for the two cities' decision to ban wildlife consumption and even consider, you know, dogs and cats as companion animals. Uh, so uh, the trend, the momentum is in the right direction. So I'm, you know, sure that the country is going to take similar actions uh, in the near future. Uh, and also one important, you know, uh, uh, you know, fact we have to, you know, understand that unlike 2003, when SARS, you know, uh, broke out, now this time we have seen greater political determination on the part of the Chinese government uh, to uh, control and to regulate and to outlaw section of the wildlife trade because they have seen the tremendous damage to human life and to economic activities in China and across the world because of pandemic, uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Okay, so it did make a change in the way people think now about a little bit about animals and how to... Oh, absolutely. You know, China has a very, you know, a very strong and expanding animal protection movement in the last 30 years. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have seen, you know, the uh, animal protection movement is getting stronger and stronger in the last few months. Now, another thing I want to point out, in 2003, when SARS broke out, we did not see a lot of government actions. But this time we have seen, you know, nationwide, local governments, national governments, and also the National People's Congress, which is China's national legislature, has also taken action against uh, wildlife consumption and wildlife trade. So you see a lot of, you know, political, you know, determination this time compared with 2003. Okay, I have a question from Mohit. He's based in India, and he says because India and China are about equal in population, uh, the, the bigness of the population. Um, why uh, is India not susceptible to origin of coronavirus like diseases? Like, why do the, these diseases come from China and not from India? That's a good question. You know, but we have to say, you know, uh, the pandemic happened this time in China. It could have happened in other countries. Now, it's more likely to happen in China. This, this is why, because China has the world's biggest wildlife, you know, exploitation industry. Yeah. Uh, no other countries compare, can compare uh, with China. Now, China's wildlife uh, you know, industry uh, is a gigantic business of, you know, in 2016, uh, a business of uh, 520 billion yuan. That's about 77 billion US dollars. Now, do you know, understand the 77 mm -hmm. billion US dollars concept? It's twice the size of North Korea's GDP. So it's an enormous industry. So when you have such a big industry in China, now there are four pieces to this industry, breeding, transportation, wet marketing, and restaurant you know, use, the process yeah. in the restaurant. So every one of these four pieces is a tremendously dangerous hotbed for potential outbreak of you know, pandemics. So you have all this large number, you know, hundreds of millions of wildlife animals from the wild and uh, captive bred mixed together, create an ideal environment for you know cross infection of viruses. So you know why not India? Why China? One, uh, the answer is very simple. China has a gigantic industry of wildlife exploitation. India has not yet, but you know India also has issues, problems that people in India and the, the Indian government must must watch very carefully. Yeah, but if you say it's such a huge uh, business, mm. then the chance of it's go the chance that it goes away is very small because that's all over the world. If something makes a lot of money, there's always a lobby. Even in politics, there's a big lobby towards it to keep it alive. So there must be people that are fighting to keep these wildlife markets alive. If it's a seven point seven U.S. dollar business, billion dollar business. Yeah, seventy-seven billion U.S. dollars. Yeah, that's a, yeah, that's a great question. But you know what? Uh, if you look at the industry. Right, individually, it, it is gigantic in China, right, individually. But we have to understand this. If you look at that industry in comparison with China's gigantic GDP, China has the world's second largest economy. So if you compare, say, even if you use 2016, you know, the data 
which is 77 billion US dollars, the industry, compared with China's, you know, gigantic, you know, GDP, it is less than 0.6%, right? Not even 1%. So for a huge country, that part of the, uh, you know, that part of the uh, economy can be phased out without impacting the Chinese economy as a whole. Okay, and then I wanted to talk to you about. Um, okay, so this has changed people's uh, opinions about the wildlife, but there's something that always. Um, so this is the animal reader we write. It's about animal news, and whenever there's a story about uh, animals from China, like the way Chinese people look at animals, is sometimes and this this it's still 1.4 billion, and there's a big yes. um, animal welfare organ like groups. The movement is growing there. I know, like so, I know it's not every Chinese per person I'm talking about, but yeah. sometimes the the stories that come from there they're so cruel. Yeah. And um, and there's no animal loss yet. Like you can you can hurt animals and nothing um, happens. There's no anti-animal cruelty laws. And but why like why are the because you have Buddhism um, like like the Chinese have a very like yeah. very um, peaceful religion background religious background. But why are they so? And this is generalized generalizing a, bit, a little bit. But yeah. why are they so extremely cruel towards animals? Yes, there are, you know, uh, criminal-minded people everywhere. And of course, there are uh, more such people in China because China has a bigger population. Uh, but I would say that uh, culturally, uh, China has a culture of compassion for the weak, for the disadvantaged, and for the older, you know, people, and also for non-human individuals. So culturally, uh, China does not have a culture of cruelty. We have to understand that one. Mm -hmm. uh, but why there are so many people, uh, you know, doing things that uh, are, you know, damaging the well-being of animals? You know, one of the reasons uh, is because of China's economic modernization. Now, China has the world's biggest uh, livestock farming industry. Uh, China raised billions of farm animals in you know uh, compromised the conditions in concentrated animal feeding operations uh, which undercut animal welfare uh, so in other words china has the biggest you know number of animals in uh animal welfare compromised situation right? so that's why make china a biggest you know kind uh, country in terms of animal cruelty mm -hmm. and also you know china has the world's biggest wildlife farming you know industry some of the uh, wildlife farming operations are extremely cruel like a bear farming i don't know if you have a read about it yeah and the live bears were caged there are about twenty thousand live bears caged you know individually uh for bio extraction from an open wound cut in the stomach right yeah uh, so this uh is all because of the uh mode of production because of the uh, uh the drive for economic modernization uh so people believe you know the natural world is a resources that we can utilize for a human benefit. But of course, there are people, right? There are people, there are small number of people who, you know, take delight in uh, hurting animals. But we have, you know, people uh, like that everywhere. So that, these are human reminded people that we, yeah. Yeah, that is, that is true. But I mean, um... So for instance, like you had the Yulin Festival, and I, you know, the, the Yulin Festival is about dogs. Yeah. It's worldwide. Every um, everybody. Pro I think it's also very. It, it becomes very. It becomes smaller and smaller. Does it still exist? The Yulin Festival. That's a dog festival for everybody watching. A dog festival in China. But yeah, the Yulin Dog Meat Festival was created, as I said again, was created by the dog meat traders. Uh, there was not not such a festival uh, before 2010. So it will all start in 2009, 2010 officially. Uh, now, why people want to celebrate the dog meat consumption? Largely because the traders want to create this festival so that they can attract visitors to the city, right? And also, you know, uh, supported by the local government, you know, agencies or departments, you know, because they believe, you know, uh, by supporting the uh, local dog meat traders, right, they can bring people, bring investment to the city and to boost the city's economic growth. So it was a short-sighted you know, decision on the part of a small number of officials in Yulin. And then it becomes such an international and a global and, of course, Chinese national, you know, uh, 
uh, you know, event and, you know, condemned you know, globally and nationally. But but the, the the thing with uh, Yulin, what I was going to ask, that is something that that my brain like to understand, like some things in China, so that everybody um that it's a big market. I understand, and I mean in mm -hmm. Europe, in the states, we are the farming industry. It's a mean industry, and it's all over the world. Yeah. It's it's yeah. mean. Um, but for instance, the Yulin festival, I've I've seen now a few videos uh, of people um, cooking dogs that are still alive because they say the more stressed the animal is, mm -hmm. uh, the better it will taste. But is that that is the part I don't know. Where does that belief come from? It like in where did those things come from? Like why do they? Because eating an animal is one thing, but then just you know kill it, eat it. But the uh, the torturing, and I've seen a few videos now where where dogs are cooked and their and their head is being um, held above the water, yeah. so it slowly gets cooking. But where does that mindset come from? To, to okay, I, I want I want to use this opportunity to tell people. Uh, you know, those videos we have seen, I have seen those videos, right? Uh, supposedly the uh, dog meat traders, Yulin dog meat festival and the Yulin dog meat traders are torturing these animals to make the, uh, the meat taste better. This entire, you know, argument and claim, uh, even the videos are suspicious. Okay. Uh, let me tell you this way. I went to Yulin at least eight times and I sat down with uh, the dog meat traders, I sat down with the slaughterhouse workers. I asked the question, do you slaughter, do you torture the dogs so that they, they can, you can pr produce the better tasty uh, dog meat? Do you boil the dog alive? Do you do this? Do you torture them? Uh, this is the answer I got from all of these people. Uh, they said, we don't have time to do that because we have to slaughter a hundred dogs every morning from three o'clock in the morning until seven o'clock so the customer can come to pick up the carcasses. We don't have time to do that. We just need to quickly, you know, kill them. We are here to make a living, right? Mm -hmm. So what I want to say is those videos could be staged, uh, okay. could, be, could be done by somebody else, right? Now, here's the important point I want to make. The dog meat festival or the dog meat industry is very ugly already. It's already very ugly. They don't need anything extra to make it more ugly. So yeah. for yeah. us, for animal you know, protection activists, we need to use you know, factual you know, information, accurate information to fight the dog meat trade. If we come up with stories, make up stories, make up videos, we are not standing on a moral ground. No, and I hope, like I, like I have never been, so I hope you're yeah. right, and I hope those yeah. those videos are produced and that they're not. There's no. So according to you, you've never heard of a Chinese person saying the more stressed the dog is, no. the better it tastes. No. That makes me really happy to hear that. So yeah. that's I, and I, I, I really hope that's true because it's the like I said. Sometimes I see videos coming from China, and mm -hmm. I hope you're right. Like I hope you're right, and that it, that it's maybe staged. Now, one more thing I want to say, you know, the dog meat trader, the slaughterhouse workers in Yulin, uh, in other cities in China, these are the most desensitized people, I have to admit. They are not monsters, don't take the, don't they regard them as monsters. They are not monsters. They are in the business for making a living. If they are not in that business, then they may be slaughtering pigs or slaughtering cows or goats, right? So they yeah. happen to be in this industry to make money to make living, but we had to understand they grew up in China in the old days, in 1960s, 1970s, when China was very poor. And most of these people grew up in the rural area. So they witnessed the livestock slaughter. So they are the most desensitized people. So they're not very sympathetic. So we can say that yet. Yeah, and, and that is also that, uh, that you see that all over the world. When you work in a slaughterhouse, I think there's been a lot written about it. You get automatically Yes. Uh, more desensitized to, yes. to what you're doing. Exactly, uh, exactly. Yeah. And the um, so Europe and the United States, we have, like, well, let me say for Holland, in Holland you have um, uh, laws against cruelty to animals, but the domestic animals. And yes. um, final thing I wanted to ask you, this was, this was also one of the most disturbing things I've ever seen. There's a, a, a student in China um, who has tortured um, around 80 cats mm -hmm. and he's tortured them in, in I will not uh, like in horrible ways. Um, yeah. uh, uh, and and not only that, he's filmed it, and he's mm. he's 
bragged about a little bit. Now there's an, uh, an, an animal uh, rights organization that found this out, that approached the university where, he, where he's working. They know who the student is, everything. And he sent some kind of apology letter saying, I'm sorry, I'm not gonna do this anymore. But then still at the same time says he's still going to do this. And when I talk about, yeah, for everybody listening, this might sound horrible. So either close your ears, but talk about it's it's really burning cats alive, um, uh, uh, drilling in them, poking out eyes. It's it's. I couldn't even, I, I watch everything that I talk about, but I couldn't even finish this. Um, but he can't be arrested. So he's, it, he's not doing this this like there there's no there's no law on which he can be held accountable for can be arrested for and like yeah why is that how 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 can it be yeah china as one of the top industrialized countries in the world right the second biggest economy and the country with a great potential technologically china really needs to legislate animal protection, anti-cruelty legislation. That's what I want to say first. Now, China is behind uh, the most progressive country, animal uh, protection legislation by 198 years. So China is very behind. Uh, so China has no uh, anti-cruelty legislation. So if somebody wants to you know, slaughter or uh, cruelty brutalize a uh, cruelly brutalize his own dog or cat he is not liable uh, legally uh, he cannot be prosecuted because china has no law against it right? uh, so but i want to i want to say in this way but this particular student who uh, brutalized more than 80 cats in different ways he could still be brought you know to justice by other laws because china has laws against the spreading uh, you know, questionable and indecent and, uh, you know, dangerous information over the internet, right? So that's one of the, uh, you know, regulation that he can be held accountable. And the second, he has been, you know, spreading and selling uh, the, uh, you know, images, the videos to, you know, some, you know, online, you know, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. you know cruelty, uh, you know, company. So that's illegal you know, sailing activity that could also be, you know, brought, you know, he, uh, he, uh, yeah, uh, you know, he could also uh, be charged under that. And thirdly, China has a law for the protection of the minors, young people. And uh, most of his information, most of the videos have been, you know, circulating in different websites and for the access of minors. So that's a huge, you know, could cause a huge traumatic experience Right, to those young children, uh, young people. So there are other laws that he can be prosecuted. And do you know whether he is being prosecuted at the moment or he's still a free man? Uh, you know, he has been dismissed from the university, right? But as, as we know that when he was warned, if he continued to do things like that, he could be dismissed, you know, earlier. And he threatened to kill a thousand cats uh, in retaliation for his dismissal, but of course the university you know, dismissed him, right? So he has been dismissed from the university, and he has been under tremendous, you know, pressure, and he has been uh, condemned nationwide in China. So he's put on the defense stand of the court of public opinion, and also about twenty some, you know, activists from across the country have already filed a lawsuit against him for psychological trauma uh, that he has uh, caused them. So he is in, you know, uh, I believe the legal process. So we'll see in the next uh, two or three weeks how, you know, the court will handle the case. Yes. And you made an interesting link between, uh, because this is an extreme case. Like, yeah. like you, you have people who do cruel things to animals all over the world. It's not just, yeah. but this was, this is a pre, like an, extreme and amount of, of cats he's hurt. But you also made a link to terrorism that when people hurt animals, there is a there is a direct link between hurting eventually humans also. Yes, you know, China has, you know, uh, according to the Chinese government, China has a terrorist, uh, you know, uh, acts uh, in the country uh, from a certain group of people. Now those people, you know, according to the official version, are uh, more dangerous, right? You know, there was an accident, there was a, you know, incident that happened in a railway station where 30 some people were uh, brutally, you know, uh, you know, injured by, you know, two, you know, what they call the terrorists. Mm -hmm. Now this particular student, right? 
he could do this and not for money. Uh, we don't believe, I personally, do, you know, do not believe that he, you know, make these videos, you know, because he want to make money. Uh, I don't think so. Now, this particular, you know, student uh, has some serious mental and a psychological issue, and mm -hmm. uh, he's a criminal minded. Now, if he can do this to a voiceless and a helpless, uh, you know, animal, he's going to, he's likely to do uh, the similar things or act similarly to other fellow humans. So if the Chinese, Chinese government does not see the, the linkage between his act to small animals and then his potential, you know, uh, anti-social behavior in the future, then the Chinese government is not doing its job. Yeah, so it's like the man is like not only for animals, but he could be a definite threat for just for people in uh, in China. So it's, yeah. I hope uh, governments there will take this very seriously. Yes. Um, last questions. You just mentioned leg legislation in China, animal legislation um, is uh, where you're behind one to eighty nine years. But so is there in the in the coming future? Do you see it happening? Animal legislation, so anti animal cruelty that you can't hurt domestic animal. I think that in the uh, immediate future, uh, people in China are expecting that the Chinese government will revise the wildlife protection law so that wildlife trade and consumption uh, can be stopped. Uh, as to the anti-cruelty legislation or animal welfare uh, law, uh, it has been you know, proposed in the last uh, 10 or 12 years, you know, since 2008, I believe, Chinese animal activists have been you know, encouraging uh, the National People's Congress to adopt anti-cruelty law. Uh, the proposals were there, and I'm sure that the Chinese, you know, national legislature is very well uh, about, you know, the importance of such a law. But I, I believe, you know, if it will happen, then the Chinese government will have to re remove some of the obstacles or opposition from the business interest. Because yeah. if you improve animal welfare, right, through, you know, a law, then some of the industries will be impacted like the livestock industry, right? Because yeah. the industrialized animal farming is intensively cruel, right? How can you, you know, balance the interest, you know, there? So there's a lot to be done. Yeah, and, and there's a lot, yeah, when it comes to, because you're the China, China specialist for Humane Society International, but there's, there's a lot of topics also in China, I think, when it comes to animal rights. Yes, yes, exactly. Uh, but uh, what what is, you know, uh, you know, uh, warm heart, uh, you know, uh, what is encouraging is this, you know, there is, as I said earlier, there is a robust animal protection movement in China mm -hmm. and uh, social media is very developed and compared with 2003 when you did not hear uh, the voices from the society against the wildlife trade and the wildlife consumption, but this time because of social media, there has been, you know, a mountain a mountain, you know, a amount of, uh, you know, opposition yeah. to wildlife consumption. Yeah. So let's, uh, it, I hope, yeah, like I said, it's a business side, but let's hope it, uh, it stops. And uh, there was one question I saw. Um, it's a, I'm still going to ask it because somebody asked it, but it, 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 I can understand why someone asked it, but I do, I do know the answer. But the question was okay. whether e eating a bat is le legal or illegal in China, but it's legal, I guess, eating a bat. Uh, let me say it this way, you know, Eating bats, bats, uh, is not very widespread in China. You know, uh, I've been to many wildlife markets in China. I have never seen bat meat sold on those markets, and I never see you know bats, and I have never read about the bats. You know, farm the bats, and then you know ship to another place because in China, the farming regions is in South China, you know, Central China but the major consumption is the big cities. I have never seen, you know, bats shipped to those, you know, markets. Uh, yeah. but, but there were, there are three, you know, local small places in different provinces, you know, locals eat bats, uh, yeah. but it, there is no such a trade as, you know, uh, bat. Uh, I would say, yes, you know, uh, eating bat uh, is illegal today, yes. It's, it's legal, you mean, or it's illegal? No, it's illegal. Legal, yeah, it's legal. And, it is legal. 
I just have to, just because of this bad story, one thing that does, co does come to mind, because you, we started off this conversation saying that the older generation eats specific, um, like eats, it goes to wildlife markets and it's not very popular, but there are some videos coming from China where I think that's China, by the way, I'm not sure, but the, of, of younger people eating um, um, uh, octopuses. Like where it's popular to just eat it, and there's a video of a very a, a really bit famous social media um, personality in in Asia who is eating an octopus, and it gets stuck to her cheek here. But there's mm -hmm. a younger generation promoting this also. Then, oh, I haven't eat, I haven't seen those uh, uh, the videos. Uh, I'm not so sure. But if it's a uh, you know as you know an animal, you know uh, marine, you know ocean, you know from yeah. the ocean. Uh, those are, you know, typically not considered the wild animals in China. Okay. Like, yeah. con that okay. considered, you know, uh, seafood. Yeah. Right? Okay. That's seafood. Yeah. Okay. That's live seafood. Okay. Um, thank you very much for your time. There's no more questions. Also, I see in the chat. Um, thank you for your time. Um, and uh, good luck with all the work you do in China. Thank you.